Thank you. So, um, my talk is called Assumptions to Reverse Engineering. I'm going to talk about a few things. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about me, about why reverse engineering skills matter. Um, I'm going to talk about NFC smart cards and smart cards in public transit, and I'm going to talk about a few different smart card systems, the security of them, and some lessons out of all of this. So, uh, to start off with, I'm going to give a little bit of a disclaimer, is that the work presented here is done by me as a personal project, not connected or endorsed by my employer, past or present. The opinions here are my own, again, not of my employers, and information here is collected from the public domain and open research. I do not condone fair evasion, and none of my software supports it. And this is also not endorsed by any public transit agency. Thank you. So, first off, hi, I'm Michael. I work for an 18-year-old Silicon Valley startup. I work in Sydney. I work on an operations team for cloud computing. Um, I work on about 50 different products and in supporting them. So I work on little products like Cloud SQL, which is a MySQL as a service, uh, and also big products like App Engine and Compute Engine, which are a platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. Uh, my day job consists of helping customers on the platform and I need to figure out what's gone wrong without having uh, shell access or source code access and maybe some logs and it requires a little bit of reverse engineering and there's a bunch of internal tools we have to help uh, make understanding what their application is doing uh, much easier so I don't get to see their source code. Um, I also need to reverse engi engineer Google infrastructure Again, I have no shell access, but I have logs, monitoring, and some documentation, and some source code. And uh, in the end of the day, I need to solve the problem and put it all together in a solution for our customers. Today, I'm going to be focusing on public transit smart cards, which is a process of reverse engineering unknown binary data files. Most of the talks that you may see about this topic are about implementation flaws that give you free rides and they write their own little program that exploits this fact and keep it to themselves because they don't want to get sued into the ground. Um, I'm basically not interested in that kind of stuff. I'm interested in getting access to the data on the cards. So, um, why do reverse engineering skills matter? You know, everyone writes great documentation and they always release source code and everything is amazing. But the problem is, is that most documentation sucks. It's not about of any sort of malice, though. Some people believe that source, doc, source, source code is documentation, and they are liars. Um, it helps a bit, but you may not understand the full intent of the design. And you might even not have in, even have access to that source code. So some common problems is that some documentation may be out of date. It's the tech writer's problem. It's someone else's problem. We'll deal with it later. Uh, some documentation may be incomplete. The writer doesn't understand how much knowledge they have and they'll just skip over things. As an example of this, when I was writing this talk, I went through about three or four different revisions because I realized that I had been looking at this problem for a long time and became one of those annoying domain experts and I needed to kind of simplify things. And sometimes the documentation may not even exist. Uh, or you might not be allowed to read it. Um, the other problem is, is that the person who wrote that software left your company years ago, and they're on some tropical island in the Pacific and enjoying a nice beer. The other problem is it could be written by you two years ago. Now, if you took a piece of code that you wrote two years ago and hadn't touched it and picked up again today, you might not be able to understand it anymore. What would you remember about its structure? What would you remember about how it was supposed to work? Think about all of the things that you have learned in the last two years and how much your code has changed as a result of that. You thought it was great once, but now it doesn't look so good. So good reverse engineering skills help mitigate the impact of these issues. And good documentation also helps there. But that doesn't always happen. Hopefully you walk away with an appreciation of what you could do with reverse engineering and some different approaches or at least become an advocate for writing great documentation and making it available in the open. And also that security by obscurity doesn't work. So some examples of projects that started out from reverse engineering things 
um, is the Samba project. Now, this allows non-Windows systems to interact with Windows file sharing protocols. It was started by uh, Andrew Chigel, who is based in Australia, and he started out reverse engineering the NetBIOS protocol. Uh, another good project uh, is things like LibreOffice, StarOffice, OpenOffice, um, AntiWord. They contain reverse engineered readers and writers for Microsoft Office documents. They support obscure things like Windows 95, sorry, no, uh, the word for Windows 95. Um, and yeah, they were basically built up from first principle. One of the biggest things for me is the IBM PC compatible. Uh, in the 1980s, each PC vendor, vendor had their own version of DOS. They may have been using the same x86 processors, but they all had the different quirks. MS-DOS generally ran on them, but for speed, people wanted to directly access hardware, and software wasn't always compatible as a result. Eventually, um, a bunch of different vendors reverse engineered IBM's BIOS and to make things called an IBM compatible. They built faster and cheaper machines. They built the first portable computer, which is the size of a sewing machine. It weighed 13 kilos and cost 9,000 Australian dollars in today's money, but it was successful. Another great project, uh, set of projects I like is every video game console emulator ever. The main project uh, emulates about 1,000 different arcade systems. It allows you to run old games on modern hardware. So as an example, I can play arcade games that are designed for pro like a proprietary console on my Android TV using a wireless Xbox 360 controller, which was also it's also working on Linux as a result of reverse engineered drivers. Um, the other part is, another good thing is uh, video game console homebrew. So video game consoles are basically just restricted computers. And since the 1990s, people have been figuring out how to run their own code on them um, and write unlicensed games. It requires anything from cartridge adapters with like a floppy disk or an SD card slot to mod chips um, sometimes it can be s as easy as burning a CDR in the correct way, in the case of the Dreamcast, or scanning QR codes in the case of the 3DS. So, getting on to the original topic, which is NFC smart cards. They are an all-in-one device. The old devices, they use an integrated circuit, which means they're discrete logic and they can't ever be updated. Newer devices use a microcontroller. They have some sort of operating system on there that allows you to run user code, for example, Java card. And the OS is generally stored on read-only memory. They're powered by induction from the reader, and they're very low voltage, so they can't be very powerful. They have bidirectional communication over radio frequencies. Simple tokens, um, they just report back a number, but uh, smart cards are much more than that. They generally have some storage, and it may or may not be rewritable. Or it might be write once. The integrated circuit or the microcontroller controls the access to the data, and it might also implement cryptography. Most Android phones contain some sort of NFC hardware, which is also accessible for third to third-party application running on that device. And most cards follow standards, so they can be read by most Android phones, which is very convenient for us. So, smart cards get used a lot in public transit systems. The first one of these systems uh, started rolling out in 1996 in South Korea, followed in 1997 by uh, a system in Hong Kong. They're generally made by a small number of vendors worldwide, um, and they don't roll their own stuff from scratch. And every place has their own minor tr tweaks for the agency's fare structure. So in Australia, the first si one of these systems appeared in Perth in 2006, followed by here uh, in 2008, uh, then Victoria and Tasmania in 2009, Adelaide and Canberra in 2011, Sydney in 2012, and Northern Territory in 2014. Now, there's a bunch of other regional operators, which I haven't listed here, because they are just too numerous. So, going back to what I was saying before, is that they're generally designed by a small set of co uh, companies. They're mostly off-the-shelf systems with some customizations. It's good for me, because it means that these systems are designed in very similar ways. Now, 
Every single one of those companies on the slide has other systems in use somewhere else in the world. The only exception there is Victoria's, which for some strange reason was written by a company that had never built a ticketing system before. So for commuters, what we get out of smart cards is we get the convenience, especially when we have automatic top-ups from credit cards. The paper tickets, they tend to fail over time and degrade much quicker. So you might be able to use a paper ticket 100 times, but you'll be able to use a smart card 10,000 times. There's also some loss and theft prevention features of the card. We can cancel cards um, if they've been stolen or lost, and you can have them reissued you, to you with no balance lost. For a transit operator, they're a stored value card, which means that commuters always pay the current fare rather than buying a number of trips in advance. They get to do long-term tracking of travel habits so they can use that information to redesign the bus routes to better serve commu commuters. They have some fraud mitigation features. Um, it's harder to create cards than with a, a smart card than a magnetic stripe ticket, and every unit of a smart card is tracked. It's also easy to identify those using concession cards. When you use your concession card on a bus here in Brisbane, it has a different chime to what it would be for me when I'm using a regular card, so that the ticket inspector knows you to ask for your student ID. Um, registered cards also do individual commuter tracking. Uh, in Queensland, uh, the police have used this information to contact commuters about incidents that have occurred on public transit in an attempt to identify offenders. But there's still a major downside to this, all this stuff, is that you can't read the card with your eyes anymore. There's all this data that you could use, but that's not entirely true. The good is um, Opal. So Opal is the ticketing system that's used in Sydney. It's the only card in Australia to offer online services to access your card without registration. They have a freely readable sector on the card, which is used by their Android application, but strangely they block rooted devices. You can still register your card if you want, but it's by no means mandatory. The bad is pretty much everywhere in Australia. If you want online services, you need to register your card and give over your name, address, telephone number, mother's maiden name, date of birth, la da 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 da. If you want, ah, sorry, there's no official app for working from those cards either. There's a bit of a strange one is that Perth allow you to check your balance by telephone without registration. Otherwise, you need to visit a ticket machine or a ticket office in order to find out what's on the card. The regional operators are much worse. They don't have any phone or online facilities. You have to visit them in person at their office. So, if only there was a way to read many different cards conveniently from wherever you happen to be. So, uh, there's a project called Fairbot, which is an open source application for reading public transit smart cards on Android. It abstracts away all the different implementation details into a standard data model. It reads only data from the card and not from the internet. It started out by reading the Orca card, which is uh, used in the greater Seattle area. It supports about a dozen other cards, but n when I started, none of, them, no, no, none of the cards in Australia. Um, I started writing some patches for this, and I discovered it was basically unmaintained since 2013, but the author's recently starting to pick it up again, which is good. Um, they based, the author had got a job with another company and left Seattle, so wasn't using it anymore. But in the interim, I forked it and made a project called Metrodroid. As you see here, it is reading a Go card, um, looking at some travel history of a trip I took between um, Central and Willowin. And I implemented support for the Opal card, the Manly Fast Ferry card, the Go card, and partial support for Mikey. And I did a bunch of code cleanup and refactoring as with this as well. So, what actually goes on a card anyway? So this is a bit of a high level system overview. It doesn't represent any particular one system. It, some systems might implement parts of this, but not others. So you start off by you having a back office system. It has a database of all the cards and the balances and the transaction ledgers. You have some fixed turnstiles and with uh, validators and they're on things like train platforms and ferry wharves. These normally have a fixed connection to the head office. You might also have a website 
which allows online top-up by credit card, and you might also have some vending machines. If you're looking at a traditional system design, you just connect all your transactions to that back office system directly, and you're done. But there's a small problem. You have buses, and buses move. They only have an intermittent connection to the head office. They go in tunnels, they drop out. So you have to store some of the transactions on the card as well as its balance. When you use the card on a bus, the bus calculates the fare and adds a transaction to the ledger on the card and keeps a copy of that on the bus. You then go and catch a train. And again, uh, it reads the contents of the cards and adds its own transaction to the ledger and keeps a copy of this for itself and updates the balance. Then, as, over time, as the readers get connectivity, they um, send all those transactions to the back office system. At the end of each day, the back office system needs to audit those transaction records to make sure that they're all okay. There's a speed advantage to doing this as well because there's less load on that back office system and it's fully distributed. So let's say I backed up my card and it had $5 on it. I then used it on a bus and that bus cost $2 and so now I have $3 in card then I restored that back up, so I have $5 again. I then went on a train, and the train cost $4, and so now I have one. The problem with all of this is that there would be tr conflicting transactions in the audit that would be picked up by the back office system, and they would blacklist my card. And then, at the end of the day, that blacklist gets pushed out to all of the readers so that I can't use my card anymore. So, this is how that data is actually stored. Uh, every card has a serial number that uniquely identifies that unit. It may also contain some manufacturing information about who made it, when it was made, and how much memory it has. Simple cards are comprised of sectors containing user data, access control labels like read-only, or read-write, or decrement-only, and, the uh, there's, and there's keys that are used for authentication with the card. More complex cards divide the memory up into applications with well-known IDs. This allows the card to have multiple functions. For example, you could have a frequent flyer card on one, with one application for the frequent flyer uh, card and another one for acting as a credit card. Um, they may also use files instead of sectors, and those, sec and those uh, files can have well-known functionality. For example, a purse file could implement validation rules uh, on the card itself. Uh, and so you can only ha you have a minimum value and a maximum value. Uh, they may also run Java card applets, which allows more complex business rules and custom cryptography to be implemented on the card. And they can also be of arbitrary lengths. So, uh, what's in the, let's, let's have a look at what's in some of these different cards. The first card I looked at was Opal, because I live in Sydney, so I'm going to look at Opal first. Um, it's readable by most Android phones. It uses a uh, MyFed Desfire EV1. All but one sector on the card is locked, and they use public key authentication, which is fairly strong. They have this free read sector, which is 16 bytes, and I've shown the data, base 16, 16 encoded on the slide. So, I don't understand how this goes together yet. So, I need to get some more facts. Now, as I said, they release, they release their own app. So I look at the Opal Travel app, I have a look at what it can read off of my card, and I can also disable network access in the application in order to ensure that it's really reading off my card and not somewhere else. And I can also look for some uh, expected constants. So what I know about the card is its number, that it's, I know what its balance is, I know that it has no automatic top up, I know that I last used it on the 5th of October 2015, and I know that I last used this card on a bus. And so the first thing I did is I observed other people's cards as well. And there's this common prefix at the start, and the last digit is probably a checksum. So what I need to do is look for the card number. And I can just put this into a hex editor, and here I'm using ghex. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see that there's a bunch of different encoding methods that it could possibly be. And if I look at the unsigned 32-bit integer, I see the number 1234567, which is my serial number that I talked about before. 
So the balance was another challenge because when looking at it in a hex editor, I couldn't find it. So I converted the file into this long binary string um, and converted the balance into another long binary string. So I have 336 cents on the card. And I look for those bits on the card and I find it. Now, in reality, there was a little bit more experimenting to find exactly how long this field is. Um, I also wrote a small Python script to automate this and I put it in the Metrodroid repository so that it makes it easier to reverse engineer other cards in future. Now, another challenge was the, da the date of last use. So the first thing I tried was looking at what day of the year it was. And that was the 277th day of the year. And I found nothing. I eventually wrote some other little hacking up scripts to try and experiment with the epoch. And I eventually find that the epoch is uh, the 1st of January 1980. And the magical number of 13,061 appears in the card. Again, not quite aligned. So, um, once I got that, I test all the information that I found, uh, compare it with other cards in the field, and because Opal is, uh, like, it's very easy to get my hands on more cards with Opal, I just go to a convenience store and buy more cards, so I have a stack of them. Um, I implement, Im implemented my first reader in Python, because Python is very easy for me to use, um, and then once I got that all working well, I re-implemented it properly in Java for Metrodroid, and ran tests again and made sure all the bugs and special cases are handled. Um, one of the special cases that I didn't handle correctly initially was negative balances. And I needed to make sure my assumptions were correct. And I got a card with negative balance and found that I made a mistake. And it said that I had something like $22,000 on the card. And fixed that bug and all good now. So, in summary, there is an open sector on the card. I find that the official application can read it as well. I started poking at the data to implement a reader, uh, confirm my assumptions, and push this all live. All good. Then I started to look, I look at Sydney's other card. Now, there's a, another ferry service in use in Sydney called the Manly Fast Ferry. There's also the Manly Slow Ferry. They don't use that, obviously. It's, they use Opal on that one. Um, they use an older card system called MyFair Classic. Um, it's only readable by Android phones that have NFC chipsets made by that manufacturer. The first sector on the card was freely readable, and it has 64 bytes. And all the other cards were unreadable and locked with a per card key, which is a bit annoying. So, to give you a description of how MyFair Classic 1K works, is that it's one kilobyte on a card. There are 16 sectors and there are 64 bytes each. Sector 0 has 32 bytes that you can use for user data. Sector 1 and above have 48 bytes. That each sector has two 48-bit keys for access controls. There are some permission bits, but there's, no, there's really no such thing as open access with this card. You just use default keys. So, um, I need to amend my last slide slightly. There's only actually 32 bytes of data that I can read out of this. So, I need to get some facts. They have, the Manly Fast Ferry has no online service for ticketing. Um, the terminals appear to be offline and not really centrally connected. And so I need to find out what's on my card. So I go to the ticket office and ask for a printout of my balance. This is a dangerous journey, as politicians frequently ambush those doing research. We must be careful. <laughs> so, the printout of my balance was much more than that. It was a transcript of my, my uh, travel history. It was great. Um, everything on the card in this nice human readable format. Everything was either a purse credit or a purse debit. And they were using it as a very simple stored value card. There were some mentions on the receipt as well about a travel pass, and I found out that they killed that years ago. You can also buy uh, drinks and food on the, sh on the uh, boat as well at a discount, and they are also handled as purse debits. And it's very difficult to see where you actually went, which is a bit unfortunate. So after taking this information, I went back to the freely readable sector, and I found my card number in the open sector but nothing else. 
I compared my card with some cards that my friends had and had the same problems. So I'm going to come back to this card in a bit later. So let's talk about something more local. Let's talk about the Go card. Like the Manly Fast Ferry, it uses those MyFair Classic 1K cards, but they lock every single sector. So there is one bit of information we can get out of it, which is the MyFair UID, which is the serial number for the card. And so I compared that to the number printed on the card itself. I followed the same process of Opal, and I found out the common bits. So every card starts with 016, and the last digit is probably a checksum again. So I wrote some Python code, uh, and I used the struct module to show the binary representation of an integer, and used base, uh, base 16 encoding to match my hex dump. Um, in reality, I could also use a hex editor as well. This is just showing you a different way of doing it. So I insert the known card number, and I tell struct to pack it as a little endian 32-bit integer. And this gives us the same number again, and it's the same as a serial number. So from the MyFair serial number, I can figure out what your Go card number is, because it's the same. Um, the next problem was the check digit. Now, I found this out a little bit later on, but for the purposes of the story, we'll say we learned it now. Um, I did some Google search for um, common check digit algorithms, and the first hit was something called the Lun checksum. And it's used in a lot of different applications, like credit cards and every other type of card. And it turned out it was exactly this. And I checked some other cards and basically confirmed it. So the last digit is just a Lun checksum of the previous 15 digits. I still have this other problem, though, is that the card is locked with a per card and per sector key. Um, the readers themselves, the GoCard readers, contain a key diversification function that implements basically this code on the slide. Um, it takes in a card ID, it takes in a sector number, uh, it takes in a key ID, it does something with it, and then I get a 48-bit key. There's a couple of standard ways to do key diversification on MyFair Classic, but we don't know if that's really what's happening here, and we don't know the constants. So, this was annoying. Let's do some MyFair Classic security research. Um, now, MyFair Classic rolls its own cryptography with an algorithm called Crypto1, and it was first released in 1994. Nothing possibly can go wrong with that. What else was introduced in 1994? The first version of Netscape Navigator. Um, Micro Internet Explorer wasn't released until 1995. And we also have the first Nokia mobile phone that had the Nokia tune. Now, we know today that there are flaws in the cryptography systems of both of these things. You can't use Netscape Navigator version 1 to access a site with modern cryptography. It'll tell you to go away. Um, and likewise, there's issues with GSM that allow you to do nasty things. So, let's have a look at the different research. So, the first set of attacks came 13 years later after the card was released in 2007. There was a talk at the Chaos Communications Congress in Germany. Um, now, previously, MyFair Crypto One was only implemented in hardware. This research uh, inspected the logic gates on the chip with a microscope. They used automated in image analysis to reconstruct those circuits and reverse engineer Crypto One. They also found some weaknesses in it. They were able to break a key in around about a week with 100 bucks of hardware. And there's a much more detailed presentation about this, which I would recommend having a look at. There was some other research as well after that, but the next thing, this is an offline attack, so this is a, an attack that I can do without access to a legitimate reader, and I can do it home. Now, the next one is the nested attack. They released a tool called MFOC. It allows you to recover a key if you know at least one other key in use on the card, and it takes about five minutes to run with about $30 of hardware. The next one is the dark side attack. This allows you to do key recovery with no keys. It takes around 45 minutes with cheap hardware, or about two minutes if you have a Proxmark 3, which is costs about 350 US dollars. So, the response uh, from the vendor on this was first, denial and anger. 
They attempted to sue another publisher with some online attacks, um, and that didn't go very well. They then went through bargaining and recognition. <laughs> they started recognizing these issues and publishing them and suggesting different mitigation strategies. And finally, acceptance. They mitigated the offline attacks with the release of MyFair Plus. But there was still no fix possible for uh, the online, at online attacks on MyFair Classic. And which is all, is all a bit weird because the same manufacturer had already made alternative products in 2006 which didn't have these flaws. So, as I said before, there's additional atta attacks that uh, require a genuine reader on the system. They involve either eavesdropping or card emulation. Um, these attacks are not mitigated with current cards because they're protocol failures. I haven't yet attempted these. So, I go back to the Go cards. The research looked promising that I could break them, so I don't care about this decode. Uh, this key diversification function, I can just hack the planet. Who cares? So I bought a NFC reader that cost about 40 bucks. Um, the Go card was big enough for me to care that I was willing to uh, spend money. And I spent about half a day getting the software to build because most of it was unmaintained. I cracked my first card in about an hour. I loaded the keys onto my phone and I could read it, so that's great. I then booked plane tickets to come to Brisbane and started collecting some data. And I went and did some trips and I logged every step of the way. Um, so I have, a tra I have a travel log of what I've done. And, and I use the vending machines to find out what is actually on my card at a particular value of time, uh, a particular point in time. And they're great because you can go back to them again and again and they don't get annoyed. <laughs> so I took some uh, snapshots of the card every step of the way, obviously. And so, this, in this uh, example, I scanned my card, I made a backup of it, I went to the vending machine, um, I recorded my current balance, which was $11.77, and added 20 bucks onto the card, and then scanned it again with my phone. Now, this is a program called vBindef, and it shows, highlighted in red, um, the different bytes between different versions of the file. So, I see that there's this value here which has a balance and it's written in cents. There, uh, and it also alternates and there's this priority field on the card as well. So whichever has the higher priority is the most recent. This reduces the number of writes onto the card to make it last longer. There's also a checksum to validate integrity. Funding trips was a pretty similar process. I get a before and after of the card and what the vending machine says. I collect many trips from the same station to find out what changes when. The trip that went away was three days prior to the current trip. And so we see it has gone from, 80, from 83 at the top to 86 at the bottom. And so that's probably a timestamp. And it turned out that I was right. Um, and the further, in further calculations found that the number, uh, sorry, the time of day was also stored next to that, and it was stored in minutes. Now, each record has a touch on and a touch off event, and they're stored in pairs, and there's a journey number that groups them together. The other thing I find is there's a room, the, the first one is where it's got number 14. Uh, number 14 is Roma Street, and it was knocked off the card to make way for a trip to Fairfield, which is uh, number 58, and this matched the order of the, the, this matched all the other touch events on the card. And finally, there's a checksum. And a similar f a similar data format is used for top up records. And there's different flags depending on whether you topped up uh, manually using a vending machine or used automatic top up with a credit card. Now, with MyFair Classic, they don't have a formal structure for records, so you need a way to identify a Go card versus every other MyFair Classic card. So I look for common data at the start of each card, and this is sometimes called the magic. Now, the first set of bytes um, is the Cubic NextFair magic. Now, Cubic NextFair is what the system that Go card uh, runs on top of and it's present on all cards that use that system. The second set of bytes is a system identifier. Now, how I find these two bits of information out is I had a very old Go card from years ago, and it turned out to have a different system ID. Then 
I've also uh, been contacted more recently. There's another city that also uses Cubic Next Fair, and it confirmed the pattern. They just had a different system ID. The first byte is different for different systems, and I think it might be a checksum, and the last byte is always the same. So, in summary, what I find is that there is a preamble record that allows us to identify what a go-kart is. There are balance records that get alternated. There are top-up records that get automated, or alternated and contain timestamps. There's 12 touch-on and touch-off events. They get rotated through automatically. They contain times and station IDs. There's some other records that I don't understand. Um, so, but I do know enough to be useful. So, uh, now my app can read Go Cards once you install the encryption keys for your, your card. There's some extra information that I've harvested here. So, I use Translink's GTFS data to get nice uh, mapping, uh, mapping of location of stations. I still have to maintain my own database that, ma that turns a Go Card station ID into a GTFS station ID. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what all the stop IDs are yet. I also implemented a fair calculator to estimate costs. Unfortunately, this doesn't work if you're a student um, because it's a bit more difficult. So, yeah. Um, unfortunately, the actual fare that was charged, I haven't been able to find stored in the card, so I have to go through that whole complicated process. So now that I have my fancy new toys and can crack my fair classic 1K cards, I can go back to Manly and play with my toys again. Now, I applied, applied those uh, previously mentioned attacks to the Manly card. I have one open sector, so I can use the nested attack. And it turned out that they use the same key for every sector. So this was very fast. They still use a different key, uh, different key for each card, though. Now, the process for this was a little different. Um, catching the fast ferry is a bit more expensive. Um, it costs between $70 and $100 a week. So I used um, friends, colleagues who live in Mandley to validate my assertions and test it. I looked at a bunch of known values on my own, own um, card, like cost amounts, and I looked for patterns. So I always topped up more than $10. I always used more than $10, uh, sorry, used less than $10 of credit. And I looked for common bytes and look for, just look for patterns, things that had the same cost, things that happen on the same day, things that happen on different days and uh, showing what should have some common bytes and what should have some different bytes. I also had some events at the same time of the day. So I um, was traveling with two friends and I bought three drinks and they all cost the same amount and, they, and it just had the same record three times because it was uh, scanned in the same minute. So I had three identical records. I used all these patterns to sort through the records and figure out what everything must correspond to. There were some interesting differences with this card. Um, because it's used as a simple purse card, there's just, it's either a credit or a debit. Every transaction is timestamped. Each card has a different epoch for dates, and they're stored relative to January 1st, 2000, in a longer field. And then the dates, um, the dates on individual transactions are stored relative to that epoch, which made decoding dates a little bit more tricky. All the records have this fixed agency ID, um, there's a preamble magic, which I think is fixed for everyone on the same system, but I don't know what the system is or of other users. I, all I know is it was made by a company called ERG, which is now defunct, and it was probably made after the year 2000, but nothing else. Um, in individual transactions have no serial number, and identical, tra uh, identical transactions result in identical bytes. So the, the overall structure is that there is a preamble record that I can use to identify the card. There's some metadata for configuration, for uh, figuring out that epoch. There's three or less balance records, seven or less uh, transaction records, and they alternate, much like the Go card. And there's a bunch of free sectors on there as well. So when you put in the keys, it looks like this. You can see that I have $23 left on my Manly Fast Ferry card, and you can see some previous transactions I have here. Now I have removed the timestamps off of these for my privacy, so in reality it's really there. But I'm still not done. Um, I'm looking at some other cards at the moment. So uh, the Adelaide has Metro card. I have a few samples of this and some logs, but everything looks a bit obfuscated or encrypted. 
My key, I can read the card number, but nothing else. I found a number of applications on the Play Store that claim to be able to read the card, but in reality, they just scrape the website, which I don't like doing. The, the Smart Rider uh, system in Perth and the MyWay, the MyWay system in Canberra um, are supposedly made by the same company. They're MyFair Classic, they have no open sectors, and I have no samples of them, unfortunately. The AtHop card, which is used in Auckland, it has an open sector, but I'm not sure what's on it. And the Christchurch Metro card has a MyFair Classic with one open sector. And I have one of these cards, but not enough information about it to figure out what's going on, because I never used it. So, some lessons to take away from this. NFC smart cards have security weaknesses. Um, there are other technologies for using NFC, like, different NFC card technologies, and they have different problems. Plan on them being compromised. Plan on them as, a, as having about as much security as a floppy disk. It, you know, not everyone has a floppy drive, but it's not too hard or expensive to get one. Um, build a distributed ledger to detect, detect fraud on your back office system, and don't keep secrets on the card. Someone will figure out your data format, even if you don't want to share it. So you may as well share it. Interoperability and open data formats are good things. For example, there's a system that's used in Finland where they give all information about what's on the card publicly. Uh, it's written in Finnish, but that's still useful. So Opal has some useful, freely readable information, and so I haven't tried to break the rest of the card because it's not interesting. Figuring out these data formats involved a lot of trial and error. I may have just covered all of these cards in about um, 30 minutes, but there was a lot more going on here and took days of work sometimes. A lot of it's about just looking for patterns, making assertions, and testing those assertions, and then repeating the process. I'd also like you to check out my project called MetroDroid. It's um, open source software. Um, I'm interested in more, it, more different uh, card formats. Uh, provided you have good notes, you, I'm happy for you to send them to me privately if you like. Um, I'm particularly interested in getting more stop IDs for the Go card. Um, if you want encryption keys, then there may be a way to get them for your card. Um, I'm also happy to help implementing readers for other systems used elsewhere. I'm also interested in other patches that aren't related to NFC. So for example, if you wanted to make the application, my application use material design principles, then go right ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, and that is the end of my talk. Do you have any questions? Yeah. So with your stop ID, at the moment, collection is through manual processes. Yeah, so in order to get, a stop ID, uh, to get stop IDs, what I do at the moment is I scan the card. Um, there's a database inside of my application which has the ones I know about. Um, and it either involves going, actually going to those stations and figure, like you have to basically go to every single station in order to find out what the stop IDs are. I'd estimate it takes about six, six days of work just to get the trains in Brisbane. Um, and I don't live in Brisbane, so that's a lot of time. <laughs> Did you bother doing bus, bus stations? Uh, so bus stations on GoCard is, is a similar problem. They have different IDs for different stops, um, except it's much more difficult because you, can't, you have to actually go to a bus. Um, whereas going on a train, you can, just, you can drive to the station, tap on, tap off, um, scan the card, and then go to the, drive to the next station, so it's a little bit easier. And I'm pretty sure you can do the same thing with ferry wharves. No, ferries, ferries, on the, ferries on the ferry? Okay, that's a bit of a problem. Sure. Yeah, I don't know what differences happen when the, bu when the bus driver you, does things manually, so I assume that it would be the same. Um, if it shows up the same on the website, then it's probably the same. <laughs> okay. Yep. So the question is, how how do you do this when you have a credit card-based payment system? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think that you could actually store any data on your credit card. You'd actually have to record um, 
your credit card number or some derivative thereof in a PCI compliant way um, in order to figure this out, sorry, in order to uh, figure out where you've been. Um, it's a different set of challenges. So, yeah, I, I think that it's a lot more reliant on the back office system in order to implement a credit card based system. Um, I don't think that the system in Brisbane would be able to support that. They're talking about implementing that in Sydney and in Adelaide, but they are using much newer um, readers and newer systems. Okay, so the, so the comment was that as part of a recent fair review of the, um, in Brisbane, they talked about implementing this. So, you know, they may talk about implementing this, but I suspect it would be very difficult. So, um, in terms of using, like, trying to read stuff off credit cards, I don't think that that would be very possible. There's no space for TransLink or any other agency to store their own data on your credit card. Um, your bank just doesn't allow that. Any other questions or comments? Yep, back. Um, if you want to get to the encryption keys for your Go cards, there isn't a way to do it. There isn't a way to do it online. Like you can't just type in your Go card number and have the encryption key. Uh, there are resources online that give you steps in order to do that. You're welcome. Anything else? Yo. So would it possibly be possible to do card emulation with this? Um, hypothetically, you could um, clone your card and basically keep a copy, a virtual copy of it. Um, my understanding of the Android APIs around this is that um, MyFair Classic, which is the specific system used in, in Brisbane, um, it wouldn't support it. Um, you know, card emulation is a very difficult thing to do um, and it requires some fairly deep integration. Um, I understand that recently Apple has come out with a way for you to have a virtual Suica card, which is the card that's used in Japan, and um, that required them to actually release new hardware that supported the particular strange NFC protocol that the Japanese cards use but the only reason it's really strange is because the Japanese cards have been around for so long before a lot of these standards were implemented. Cool? Yeah. All right, thank you.